Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the, uh, the whole purpose of, of my talk is to convince you guys uh, about this statement. So I'm, I'm just going to read this one. You should and can be connecting with customers and users for a more successful project. So if today you are not connecting with customers and users and you're building products, you are missing one of the easiest and most powerful ways to deliver a better user experience. If the people that you work with are meeting with customers and users and you're not, you're disenfranchised from the whole design decision-making process. So we're, we're going to try and get you out of that. We're going to try and fix that today. The, uh, the talk that I'm giving is part of a, a day-long workshop that we give. We've been doing it for the last three years for our clients, trying to get their folks in their business who don't normally connect with customers and users the right skills to get out there and pull insights back to optimize what, what they can do for their product. Uh, the folks at Sparkbox, I don't know if you know Sparkbox in uh, Dayton, they run the Build Right Maker Series, and they asked us to do the workshop in an, um, an open workshop. So this is a new experience for us. We're kind of excited. Uh, we've been doing it with intact teams inside companies, uh, so I'm really excited to see what happens. Uh, uh, it's May 19th, and one of the giveaways at the end is we're giving away uh, 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 a live streaming access to that workshop. Uh, okay, so the sections I'm going to talk about is to explain what it is I'm actually asking you guys to do, and then I'm going to talk about the value of doing it, why you and your company will really benefit by getting everybody out talking with customers and users. Very thinly, I'm going to mention what the opportunities are. There's lots of opportunities, but it's very it's very situation and company specific. We can drill down to that in the Q&A. There will be roadblocks, and I think it's fair to address some of those up front. It's not going to be a rosy, like, go to your boss tomorrow and say, I'd like to talk to customers and users, and, 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 a, and a you know golden path is laid out for you. And then I'm going to tell you about what, what more there is to do. So starting off, what I want you to do. Um, the whole product team should be in direct contact with real customers and real users. And I'm going to take this apart piece by piece. First, we're going to look at whole team. So what do I mean when I say whole team? It's a broad term. I mean it as broadly as possible. I think that the people who run your live service, the salespeople, designers, developers, product managers, should all have some kind of real contact with customers and users, not just your user researchers, not just your UX subject matter expert. So product team. So again, broad as possible. When I say product, I'm talking product, service, concept. It doesn't matter what industry. It doesn't matter what technology. You can be a small company. You could be a global company. The type of industry that you focus on, irrelevant. What I'm teaching you is something that cuts across those. It can be used in any of those situations. And it really doesn't even matter what you're building. Right? You could be, my favorite is a museum exhibit. It's a product. It's something that human beings interact with. And if you're not paying attention to the humans in those situations, you're, you're missing uh, your best uh, delivery for your designs. OK, direct contact. This is where it starts getting scary. I mean first-hand observation and interactions. I see a couple of people looking uncomfortable up here in the front. Relax, relax, it's OK. Um, in person is better than remote, but live is what I'm talking about, so that you have the possibility of actually interacting and intruding in what you're observing. Uh, I do not mean reading a summary of insights that somebody else has collected. I do not mean listening to somebody else who says, I know what users want. Um, let me be clear. I'm getting you all pumped up. It's not about replacing the people whose job it is to go and get the, the requirements. It's not replacing the user researchers. It's not replacing the people who have other data and things to bring in. I'm talking about augmenting it, adding what you can bring to the table 
by doing this. This is really a little bit disconcerting. The guy who is controlling the camera is now standing out in the hall. OK, <laughs> texting. All right, contact. We take a little deeper here. I am talking about some of the least invasive user research techniques, which also means that it's the easiest for you folks to do, to acquire how to do it, and to put in place. Um, these are actually the four basic techniques that we teach in the workshop, which is all about how. It's all about getting you a demo, uh, getting you an opportunity to practice with each other, and then we bring in real customers and users at the end of the day so you can practice it. It's, it's about getting comfortable. But the first is active observation. This is probably the easiest because it's teaching you to get structured insights, watching a real person do their job totally uninterrupted. Right? So there's no need to get the user to do something or instruct them or inquire or interview or survey. You're just learning how to watch. Second is inquiring for clarity. When you have a hypothesis, when you think you've learned something, this is about asking the minimal questions to just clarify if what you saw was what you thought you saw. Then it's the talk aloud, pro talk aloud protocol, also called protocol analysis. And this is great because once you cue somebody up and you train them as to what they're supposed to be doing, your job as a facilitator is to just sit back and listen. And you get them to talk and talk and talk. Because when you observe someone, you get their behaviors. When you get them to talk, they're opening up the covert processes that are going on in their head. And they're reporting to you. What are they seeing? What are they thinking? What are they anticipating? What are they disappointed by? And how does the success feel when they hit it right? And then the last one is descriptive storytelling. Again, you're queuing up the user to do the thing that they do, but to tell you the context of that. And when they do that, again, as a facilitator, you just sit back and listen, using your structured observation skills to pull things out. So that's what I mean by, by contact. <clears throat> Customers and users, all right? So here again, sorry, we're gonna be really broad. These are the people who buy, use, build, install, service, it's not the person who's necessarily paying you. It's not necessarily the person who ends up using it. If you think of the full embodiment of the product that you make, there's human beings who touch it at different points in the life cycle. I'm talking about all of them. Each of them has something to teach you that you can put into the thing that you build to make that thing work better for them. Um, a whole bunch of possibilities who they are. Real customers and users. I'm going to stress this again, real and real. And here's the why. Because real customers and real users are closer to this absolute truth. You can't always get real users, and I realize that. But if you get people who are approximate representatives of the people who are going to be using it, it's just going to be more accurate than if you pick a random person off the street. And there's a whole bunch of people who are definitively not your customers or users. They're your product managers. They're your clients. They're your family. They're your coworkers. And in bold letters, you. Because the truth of it is, right, if we sit and we build something and we have no guidance and you have to make these hundreds of decisions that you do as a designer every day, who makes those decisions and who do you make them for? It's you, right? You go, hey, I like blue. It's going to be blue. Um, so there it is. The whole product team, direct contact, real customers, real users. All right. So I'm asking you to do something that I know is a little uncomfortable. Right? How many people here on a regular basis seek out customer and user contact? All right. Good, good. Maybe a quarter, maybe a third here. So for the rest of you, this might be a, a new thing. All right, so, so why would you listen to me? It's all I've done for 30 years, right? My whole career is based on the fact of extracting insights, data, information, patterns, transforming that into products. And the best ones that I've ever worked on is where I can bring a whole bunch of people on the team with me into those observations. Um, before running the business I run now, I worked Microsoft, Bell Labs, a bunch of, of big companies. I've worked on hundreds of projects, and I cannot tell you the thousands of people that I've watched doing what they do. Uh, it's an awesome job to be a spy, and uh, I've learned things and, and seen into people's lives 
that sometimes I never wanted to. Uh, <laughs> But I uh, currently run an independent UX company. We're based in Dayton. And uh, we focus on uh, technology and technology-enabled companies. And especially our sweet spot is if they have complex products and services. Uh, we just, the, the harder it is, uh, the more we love it. All right, so now to the value. Why should you do what I'm asking you to do? All right. Uh, let me turn around and you're thinking, why should I go and talk to customers and users? They're going to give you uh, insights. The insights will help you learn things. And here are some of the things that you could learn. Um, when you are out watching uh, a user, user's going to be doing something. And you come with this unique set of life experiences, the things that you know about the product, uh, about your uh, technology, the discipline that you bring, uh, heck, who you went to high school with. There are influences that are different from the next person on your team. So if you're not there when that connection happens, there's a possibility that an insight may be completely mixed. Because what happens is the user does something, says something, that combines only with the things that you know. And when they come together, that's when that light bulb goes off. You make an observation that nobody else on the team can make. Even a trained user researcher, because they're bringing their expertise and their experiences, but they don't have yours. And that's why it's really important that, that everybody on the team gets to go there, because that's when we maximize all of the experiences that we bring into the picture. And it's not something that you can go and ask customers for. You can't go and say, hey, just tell us your insights. right? Tell us the things we don't know about what you'd like to build, like us to build for you. It doesn't work that way. right? They don't have your insights. Their managers don't have the insights. The people who are asking you and paying you to do this don't necessarily have. They may have a goal in mind, but you need something special to help deliver it. I'm going to tell you two stories. Um, we were doing an observation for a client in a professional office. And I'm going to try and make these as anonymous as possible. Um, but it's a professional office like an architecture office or a dentist's office. And we were looking at how those people were using our clients' tools. And that was our mission. Right? We were going to do some shadowing. And one of the people who was in this group who went, not a user researcher, comes to the lead person in, in this, the, the person who is a user experience professional, and said, I think you need to see this person down the hall. And there was a woman who worked in this office who was critical to the functioning of the business. Everybody said that role-wise, they always checked with her. And her data was a closet full of binders. They would come and they would ask her a question and she would go, hang on, and she'd go into her closet and she'd come back and she'd say, here's your answer, and they were good to go. And it stunned us because the client who was hiring us had no idea that this role existed in their customer base. The customer never said, hey, we've got somebody who needs tools. The woman was perfectly satisfied with the way she was doing things. A closet full of binders. So, so here was this person on the team, not particularly uh, looking for this, who said, there's something wrong with this. It led us then to investigate that, to confirm that it was throughout the customer base. And we wound up generating 13 different product ideas, 11 of which came to market for our client who hit a market that nobody even knew existed. Because somebody who was not a user researcher said, you really need to meet this person down the hall. Google is a pre-search tool. This one's beautiful. We had a client who had a for-pay search business. You bought a subscription. And then as you used their tool, uh, you spent your money, right? You, you use the time you spend searching, the retrieving of the thing that you wanted from their exclusive database, you pull it back, you pay them. Um, and they noticed that their revenue was going down and going down and going down. So what we did was we set up the team in, in a room, and we had our uh, facilitator with a remote access to their actual customers where they let us look at their desktop. And we said, look, we don't have any specific questions. Just tell us the next time you know, on Tuesday when you're going to use the product and would love to just watch. And oh my gosh, 
every one of the people we watched did the same thing. They went to Google first, narrowed down the search, took the results, went to our client, went bang, retrieved the thing that they wanted. So they cut down the time that they were on the client, not because it was costing them money, because the search sucked, right? <laughs> and, and so when the client was asking their customers, are you happy with our product? They're like, absolutely, we love your product. Well, how come you're not using it? Well, I use it every day. Not the way the client wanted them to. Light bulbs, because we saw people doing things. All right, data versus insights. I am not asking you to go out and collect numbers to measure things. That's what we have user researchers for, right? I want you to bring back those light bulb moments, those I connected things that nobody else saw. Um, what's the difference? Yeah, so when you go out, you are only going to see maybe one person or two people, and you're gonna immediately think, we need to do this. You might be right, but you might be wrong. You are not collecting data. You are not making statements for the whole population. You're saying, I think there's an idea here worth exploring. I think there's something we need to know. Um, if nobody is looking at users, everybody's guessing, well, if you have insights, you trump guessing because you've actually seen something. But remember, the person with data, uh, chances are they're trumping you, okay? Let's get that straight. Um, usability testing and insights, I talk a lot about field research, but you can get insights from watching usability studies without having to run them, without having to uh, structure them, design them, do the analysis, do the statistics. It's about being behind the glass or watching the recording. You can get the same kind of insights that I'm talking about. Um, I have another story. We were um, allowed one day with one, client, one customer of our client because they were super scared that we were gonna scare the customer by intruding in their business. And so we said, no, real light touch, we're just gonna go, we're gonna do the four things I told you, real non-invasive. And we started watching. And the business was a highly transactional business. And the tool was built specifically for that business. And these are the, the, the client is the uh, national leader. They, they've stomped the market in this. Um, anybody who does this job could get transaction that they have to do from the tool itself, which happen on a regular schedule. They could come because uh, some business has flowed in and it just piles up and distributes to the people doing it. Or I could be sending it to you because I know you're an expert in those particular kinds of transactions, though it came to me. I field it to you. Um, and then there's things that happen on a regular schedule. There's even people who sit at a desk where the public could come up. So you never really know what kind of transaction you're gonna do. So the tool was built so that you could do this. Any one of those things at any moment from, from this kind of base uh, dashboard screen. And we watched the first two people do this. And someone said, I think she's assigning it to herself. Well, why would someone do that? Right, so we watched, and we all watched the people we were following a little bit more closely. And sure enough, people were assigning tasks that came in and triaging them to themselves. So when we got to the point where we could ask for clarity, we said, I think you're assigning them to yourself. Why? And they said, oh, because I know I'm going to get 700 of these things in a week. So I assign them to Friday mornings or Thursdays or whatever group makes sense. And then when I come in the morning, I spend the first three or four hours going, didn't pay a water bill, send a dinging letter, put them on notice. Didn't pay a water bill, send them a letter, put them on notice. Didn't pay a water bill, send them a jump, send them a jump. 700 times. Because the tool was designed for individual transactions. And she thought that it was more efficient to sit there for three or four hours going bing, 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 bing. Right, so what's the light bulb? Give her a two minute task, these 700 people, put them on notice, send them a letter. Two minute task. Nobody was asking for it, people were not complaining. No requirement ever came out that said build this as a batch. So this insight stuff that I'm, I'm trying to get you to do, how much do you need? Well, I'm gonna use this phrase a lot. There's a continuum, right, it all depends. Uh, let's say that we're looking at how much knowledge you want about a customer or user. Well, we could guess, 
which is kind of where a lot of people build their products from. So let's imagine that we are a team, right? And we got a new client, and the new client does a finite element analysis, right? And we have to build a new tool for them, which takes that to the next level of efficiency. So, uh, hey team, what do we know about finite element analysis? Who has any experience with finite element analysis? Excellent, we have one person on the team. So we're not guessing anymore, but we don't know the absolute truth as a team yet. So his experience counts for something. It would be great if we had some insights. Maybe we need some data. We as a team have to decide what our comfort level is. If he wasn't here, we'd be here, way down the end of too little, right? Because this is a highly technical engineering capability, and we're supposed to build a tool for it. So OK, we have a little bit of experience with one guy on the team. And I'm not comfortable with that. I don't know how much your expertise goes. Um, but I want something more. But at some point, it's going to be too much, right? We're going to spend a lot of cycles learning about something, and maybe it's overkill for what we actually have to deliver. So we have to figure that there's some space in between those two that's the benefit bar, where it pays off. And we have to get into that space somehow. When you do this exercise, it's going to vary. It's going to be on what project, on what team, your circumstances, the budget, the time, all sorts of things. That bar moves all over, large, small. But more often than not, insights fall within that bar. So it ends up being one of the most powerful things that you can do above guessing or having previous experience. Do I need to test you to see if you really know what finite element analysis is? My father was a failure engineering expert. Thank you. Done. <laughs> um, but this bar in the continuum holds for all sorts of things that I'm going to mention in the talk, the risk tolerance of any particular team. Um, are you ready to ship this product and bet a beer on it being a success? Or a six pack? Or a case? or as much beer as they have in the refrigerator in the back, right? It's, it's tolerance levels. Uh, same thing for minimum viable product. How do you decide when you've hit the benefit bar and it's ready to go? All right, so for what I'm asking you guys to do, there's a continuum. Uh, there's what you can do today. There's what you can do with training. You can apprentice. You can get a degree. You can go on to be a user research subject matter expert. I don't really care how far you go down on the continuum. I'm only asking you to pay attention way down here, right? Just a bare step off of the jobs that you already have today. So why would you do it? Number one reason is having a voice. If you are a person who has insights and you bring them back to your team, it gives you power that you do not have today. You can take part in these discussions. You get a seat at the table with the adults because there's people, believe it or not, who are making those decisions, who have the authority and the title that grants them that, they don't have any insights. They've never seen a customer or a user, right? You can be part of that game where you may be totally disenfranchised today. Um, if you do this, people will start to recognize, hey, you know, that Sean guy, he seems to have some real insights about what our customers are doing. And then you'll become more valuable to the company. And of course, that continuum, the more you do it, the more insights you bring, the more value that you have. Number two, you're going to be making better design decisions. If you um, have an insight, it quiets that doubt that you have. Right? You're going to make something this way or that way. Oh, wait a minute. When I saw that person do that thing, it's definitely this way. Um, sometimes you learn things that you didn't know. Right? You went looking for one thing, but your discovery, your observation taught you that there was something you should have been thinking about that you hadn't been. And new problems and new ideas. Sometimes when you go out, um, you discover that there was something wrong that you never knew about before. That's a valuable insight to bring back. Sometimes you learn that there are opportunities, like that woman with the closet, where there are new features. And even when you're not seeking it out, it brings ideas to mind because you now see that opportunity firsthand. And uh, I know you've been waiting for this story. This is my story of the woman with the scissors. All right. So I'd been designing for a while. And 
If you're lucky, the observation of real users will give you a transformational experience like it did for me. We're working on these big uh, banking machines, these things that are in the back rooms that people like us never see, things that are cranking out thousands of checks and, and, and uh, counting huge amounts of money, and they're big honking machines. And we had a prototype uh, in the laboratory, and we were doing a usability study. And uh, you know, we had a whole score of little old ladies who work in these back offices coming in to put the machine through its paces. And one of the things that you had to do, and they were simulating all of the activities, is at the one year point, you needed to change the print head. So basically, you shut the machine off, you put it in the right place, you take that print head out, you take the new one out of its container, you put it on, you're done. This woman uh, gets to that point, and she reaches into her purse, and she pulls out the biggest scissors I have ever seen in my entire life. These are not the scissors you cut paper with. These are not the scissors you cut your kid's hair with. These are the kind of things you use to shear sheep. <laughs> it was like a scene out of Psycho, right? She walks up to that machine, and she just starts jamming those scissors in and doing this thing. And of course, we're out of our seats. We're, we're like, stop, <laughs> right? We didn't say, this is a one-of-a-kind prototype. We said, it's electric, right? <laughs> what, what are you doing? And she looked at us like we were insane. And she goes, well, I always use this on your equipment. We all do. And I'm like, why? <laughs> and her answer changed my life. She goes, you design these for men. We can't take that out without a tool. And it occurred to me, the whole team was male. The whole product team was male. Everybody who tested it and built it could easily reach up, reach in, grab that damn thing, pull it right out. The people who used our products could not because we did not realize that they're built differently. So that was one of the biggest shaming moments of my design career. And it was a single moment. <laughs> Empathy. <laughs> right. <laughs> they kind of go hand in hand. Yes. So, you humanize the customer, you realize their pain, they stop being people who, if the user would just press the button, I just need the user to press the button. It becomes, why is the user doing this? What's their motivation? Could I meet their motivation and their need with a button? Right? And it's not, if the customer would just buy this, it becomes, what do they want that they're willing to pay for the thing that I provide? Uh, Empathy is a super powerful thing. Again. There's a continuum. I'm going to shorten this uh, just because of time here. If you ever get a chance to do an Adopt-a-Customer program, it's fantastic. The basic idea is you and a team of people, a varied team of people, again, sales, marketing, developer, designer, user researcher, adopt an individual customer. And you are their spy. You are their nanny you are their support structure for an entire year. Um, you go the first day they get the product, and you take them down through all the stages of what they do. You visit them once a week, and then it's once a month, and then you are on call whenever they have a problem with the product. You learn in depth something that you will never learn from looking at a, a survey or analytics on 1,000 people. You learn one human being's experience, and it's super powerful. Um, along with that, goes the ego slap, right? So you go out, you're watching people use your product. Damn it, somebody's going to tell you how dumb you are, right? They're going to say, who designed this thing, right? How could they have done X? And you're sitting there going, well, I'll go back and tell them, right? No, uh, it is humbling. Uh, you're going to get bruised. But it's also extremely motivating to see someone stumble over something that you put in their path. And then you, you sit there and go, uh, OK, how, how can we fix this? And I'm not going to kid you. It's really hard. Um, but there's that continuum again. Right now, I'm going to bet some of you are in this blissful ignorance. How many people here think that they make bulletproof great products, right? And, and have, have, have the, like the most awesome code. And everybody just, I, I see you smiling. You're just afraid to raise your hand, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's you. It's you. 
Uh, that's blissful ignorance. But then there's the other end of the continuum, right? Where if you take this too personally, uh, you'll stop coding, you'll stop designing because you think you, you're doing more harm than good. So stay away from that edge, but definitely get out of this edge, start working your way uh, into the middle of that continuum. It's, it's gonna be good for you, trust me. Uh, I'm gonna skip the Alan the customer story because I already look like I'm an idiot because of the scissor thing. Um, Alan the customer story, it's, it's even worse. It's even worse. Um, reason six, means to validate or contradict. Um, when you have an insight and you come into your team and the team is talking about, hey, the design says we're going to do this, well, you go, hey, that, that jives really well with the insight that I got from watching that user. And you say, yes, absolutely, I support it, I've seen it, we're on the right path. Or you go, eh, we have a contradiction. Uh, I don't know what's behind it, but people do this and we build that, there's going to be a big gap between them. So again, it's a powerful way to bring insights into the team and, and uh, both of them have value because uh, contradictions, while people may get annoyed and feel like you're slowing things down, it's worth an investigation. It's worth that one moment of pause to check it out. My absolute favorite, shortening conversations. Let me say it again. My absolute favorite. Why? Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about the UK. We had a client there who called us up. We'd done some work for them and they were coming up on their next release. And they said, we'd love you to come out and help us because you, know, you were so much help the last time. But now we've got these three competing lists of the features that should go into our next product. One came from marketing, one came from the product side, and I think one came from R&D. And we, look, we got there, we looked at their list and we said, where did these lists come from? And they said, R&D, marketing, and product. And I'm like, no, no, no. What's behind them? And there wasn't anything behind them. They were generated by those teams based on their wish lists of features. And they didn't agree. So we said, you're all wrong because you're not looking at customers and users. And the solution was not one that the client wanted us to actually do. They wanted answers from us. And what we said was, we're going to give you one of our people, and they're going to get one person from each one of those three groups and the four of them are gonna go visit 30 customer sites. And they're gonna watch people using the products and they're gonna ask them questions. And I guarantee you by the end you'll have one list. And that's exactly what happened because those people who were representing those groups had a shared observation, had the opportunity to discuss what they saw, who shared those insights so that the things that made sense wound up being a much shorter list of features that customers actually could use. All right. Um, I kind of covered that. So if you want to boil it down, here's the way it works. If none of us are talking to customers and we still have to build a product, we all argue out of our own ignorance. If I go out and it's my job to bring these insights back, well, that's better, but then I just end up arguing with all of you who didn't go and have those experiences. But if we can all go out, that's where we get the shared insights. That's where we can have a discussion, we can come as a team to a way to move forward without disenfranchising any of the ideas and opportunities that we had along the way. So, um, any questions before I leave the whys? Yes? Well, I was, if anything, you know, I was wondering about the business. I mean, I didn't really know that it had to be a company that had a lot of Yes. Yes. So I'm going to paraphrase your question was, what do you do um, when something's already designed, when there's, uh, you know, usability testing and you end up having to tell somebody that their product's ugly? And, how and Yes. So I am going to talk a little bit about some of the roadblocks about management in particular. Um, but I think that there's something that you said that, that fits in really nicely when you were talking about their users too. And they have opinions. And I saw you kind of move your head like, well, not really. Well, guess what? Not really, right? They're not users. I'm not a user. 
You do. Now, now we could have a whole talk about the ROI of user experience. And there, you know, the, the, the strange thing is, there's data going back at least as long as I've been in the field. Because when I joined 30 years ago, I joined a team of people who'd been doing this for 25 years. And they had the same, they had amazing data, right? I, I, my first job was at IBM. They measured everything. At IBM, they build into the product budget plan that for every dollar spent invested in UX, they expect a $10 return. And then they measure what they really get, and they get up to 100 times that $1 investment. This is known. This is not new. Convincing people who got their MBAs about all that data is very, very hard. And it never ends. Never ends. But anyway, that's a whole other talk. But I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to bosses later. Any other questions before I move off of this? OK. Um, so what are the opportunities? This is the part I'm going to touch really thinly. There are all sorts of ways in your company right now, things that are going on that you can tag on to. And I'm not going to drill down on these. Right? We can do that later. Each one of these leads to a, a whole description of how you can fit in. Let's get to avoiding the roadblocks. All right. So what if your boss or company or team leader or somebody says to you, no, we are not talking. You are not talking to customers and users. It's not going to happen. Go away. Um, you have to change the conversation. You don't come in saying, why, you know, I think we should because of this. You should be leading with, why aren't we, right? Agile, lean, they're all talking about delivering customer value. How are we to know what customer value is if we're not connecting with customers and users, right? How are we behind other groups that are doing these things? Because there are, and I hate to say it, especially in the Midwest, it's a much harder sell. I came here from the West Coast. We, we used to live in, in Seattle. But before that, I was on the East Coast. The coasts just seem to get this better than here. Uh, and, and I can't put my finger on it. Um, so you, you use some of the things that I told you, the seven points. You start digging into whatever process you're using and showing how it hinges on customer insights that you're not gathering. You, do you guys know the 110, 100 rule? You've heard of it? The basic idea is if you can get insights during design and you can fix a problem or turn it, and it, say it costs you a dollar to make that difference, if you wait until coding starts, that same little twist and turn is going to cost you 10 times as much. If you wait until the product is out and it stumbles and you have to fix it, it's 100 times. So I'm not talking about a dollar. I'm talking about that dollar could be $100,000. And you see how the scale goes up. It's logarithmic. It's painful. So those are good leveraging, even if you don't get into the details of R&I. Um, but the biggest thing that you can do is the biggest fear of people who are keeping you from talking to customers and users. They're afraid that you're going to do something stupid. I've even had leadership tell me, you are not taking devs out in front of real people. <laughs> Why? Because when the customer says, oh, gee, you know what we really want is a feature that does x, y, z. And the dev's going to go, well, that's about four hours of coding. Yeah, we could do that. And then the manager feels like we've made a commitment to the customer. You've just some, done something really stupid. Now, let's not forget that the executives and the managers are constantly committing to delivering schedules with no idea of what it takes to really develop it. And they're constantly saying stupid things. And we can't stop them, but they can stop you guys from talking to customers, right? So the second thing is, they're afraid you're going to say something like, well, we don't really check quality. <laughs> and the customer is just going to get scared away. So look, I have taken plenty of developers, designers. Heck, I've even taken salespeople out in front of customers. <laughs> and none of them have ever done one of these two things. Right? It's a fear. It's an irrational fear. But if you're trying to convince your management, make a promise. Raise your hand. You know, put it on the code of ethics of your company and say, I promise not to do anything stupid. It might just work. All right. Um, now, I realize that it's a hard sell. And you may absolutely be a failure at convincing your company. 
So there's an alternative. Gorilla you are. If you are motivated, if you are convinced that customer and user contact is going to help you, don't let anything or anybody stand in your way. I assume, looking around the crowd, maybe half of you have friends. <laughs> right? Let's make sure they're representative. No, I don't even care if they're representative. No, I don't care. I have run into trouble. I don't care. I know. Well, that's just your set of friends. <laughs> you need to get a more representative set of friends. But seriously. Yeah, women. <laughs> there you go. Um, but seriously, it is ideal to have real customers and real users. But if you are prohibited from that and you have access to customers and users who might be, that's good. If you're restricted from that, a substitute will get you some kind of thing to work with. Now, they could lead you in exactly the opposite way if they are totally opposite of the people that you're trying to study. Like a finite element analysis, I'm not going to bring that program in front of my barber and say, hey, what do you think? But if I happen to know a mechanical engineer who works in aeronautics and he doesn't do finite element analysis and he's not in the customer base, well, he has the training, so maybe he can help me out. Um, but there's a bunch of people. Your family is the only one I'm cautioning you against because your grandmother loves you. Um, she's going to love everything you do, even if it sucks. So don't, don't, don't do that. Um, oh, I do have a story to tell here, too. I don't think I put it out. We had a, a, a very paranoid client, and, and the tools that we were helping them build were for their own employees, and they weren't even going to let us talk to their employees about the thing they wanted us to build for them. LinkedIn. We looked for people who used to work at that company, and we called them up. We never told the client, right? And you'd be amazed how many ex-employees are willing to talk about the place they used to work. <laughs> it was great. We got a lot of great insight. We even got pats on the back when they said, you seem to have a real insight into our company. Good job. Um, you don't have to say where you get your insights from. Oh, I did have that up there. Oh, yeah, good. All right. So um, what if the roadblock isn't your boss? What if it isn't uh, all of the structure? What if it's you guys? What if you are holding yourself back? Uh, I have, uh, in my career, tried to convince people uh, who are not user experience, experience people to come on these experiences. Thank you, Kevin. Um, mixed results. When I became a manager and a director, and developers and designers and brand people reported to me. They didn't have a choice. Um, so they went out and they did these things. But um, I've heard every lousy excuse why that person should be excused from doing this horrible thing, going and observing customers and users. So I'm going to review some of those. We already talked about opportunities very slightly. I can dig in more there. Not a good excuse. There's plenty of opportunities. Permission. Well, like I said, I gave my people permission. Uh, your boss might, and if they don't, you can still do this. Uh, introvert. This is one of my favorites because, um, believe it or not, introverts have an advantage in the things that I'm talking about. Uh, extroverts going out, like me, who love to communicate with people and love to talk and meet strangers and things like that, you can't shut them up. Um, observation means, hi, how you doing? I'm here to watch you today. No matter what they do, no matter how stupid, no matter how painful, no matter when they stumble and go down the wrong path, you can't help. You can't say anything. That's really hard for an extrovert. Introverts spend a lot of their time observing the world. If you're an introvert, You've really got a great tool here. And now it may be hard for you to then share what you've seen as an observation, but your observation skills are much better than extroverts. Extroverts are too busy in their own, in their own head. Uh, time. You're going to say, hey, this is going to add time. I don't have, I have deliverables, so on and so forth. I guarantee you, you are saving time in the long run by spending that time up front. It's going to shrink the conversations you have. It's going to reduce the number of variations that you have to develop. It's just going to save you time if you take that leap. Difficult. 
I know it's difficult. I've seen people sweat under the threat of having to communicate with a stranger. I know it's hard, but I also know that if you do it once, it gets easier the second, the third, the fourth time. I respect that, it, that, that this is getting you out of your comfort zone. Oh, fear. Um, so what are you afraid of? You're afraid of making a mistake? Are you afraid of saying something stupid in front of the customer or the user? I guarantee you, you will make mistakes. It's OK. You can do that. I have been doing this a long time, and no one has ever poked me in the eye with a stick. Right? What is your greatest fear? Somebody's going to run you over with a 10-wheel truck. Someone's going to take scissors out of their purse. <laughs> no, I won't go there. I won't go there. So really, fear, I respect that too. But honestly, accept now. Have an expectation that you're going to make mistakes. You're going to come back with the lamest insight you have ever heard, and the team's going to laugh at you. It's OK. It's OK, because you will, if you persist, add value. So what's next? Where do you go from here? Um, tomorrow, you should go into your boss and say, I want to meet with customers and users. And if they say yes, that's great. Lay in a plan. See what your company's doing that you can piggyback on. But if they say no, and I mean this with sincerity, have them call me. Because I can be very persuasive. I can show them how they are missing out on the opportunity to move their business forward if they let you do this very simple thing. Um, if that doesn't work, invite me to give this talk where you work. I give this talk all the time. And if that'll help get your company pushed in the right direction, glad to do it. Um, if you thought that learning about the what and the why was fun, there's the rest of the workshop. Uh, May 19th in Dayton, part of the Build Right uh, Maker Series. And that's going to give you the opportunity to take those things that we were talking about, see how they're done, understand the philosophy behind them, practice on each other. And we've got real users who come in at the end of the day and we test you on them. Uh, you leave at the end of the day with more experience and with the confidence that, yeah, you could do this. It's not a big deal. Uh, there's the information. And I didn't know, Kevin, do you want to do the raffle now? Or he's not? Q&A? OK. Um, so yeah, thank you, guys. That's, uh, that's all I got to say. So, Q&A. What if the, the new product and you want to guard it from being you know, toxic about or something like that? So what if you're getting information? OK. So her question was, what if it's a new product and you want to guard against someone stealing the idea, competitors learning that you're even investing in that uh, area? Um, I'm going to ask a clarifying question before I answer. Are you talking about at the concept level? Are you talking about now you have a working prototype? Concept level, OK. And I'll tell you why I asked. Because if you're already at the prototype level and you're doing validation before it goes out, don't worry. Because you can be to market before someone can catch up. If you're at the concept level, um, the people that you're studying, and you could be studying them in any variety. I mean, there's, there's dozens of user experience techniques, right? Uh, some of them involve uh, usability studies. Some of them are just observing a user. You can learn things from people by putting them in situations where you don't have to reveal what your concept is and still learn relevant things for the value of your concept. If you can't do that and you've actually got to put something in front of them, well, everybody should be signing an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, in order to participate in a usability study. And you stress with them the proprietary nature of this and what happens to people who don't. Um, so one of those big companies that I used to work for, everybody does it, all, all of them did, but one of them I actually saw take two people to court. And they, they sued their butts off uh, because their competitor, some several states south in California, um, learned of this, actually got the person to share screenshots of the thing. And, uh, 
they, they basically blew millions of dollars of secret uh, development. So I would say uh, be cautious, but there are ways that you can go up that continuum and, and protect it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of it is just threat. Yeah. And it's important to screen so that nobody coming in your study is from your competitor. <laughs> yes, in the back. So the Scrum Master said, okay, let's just solve this piece first because, you know, it had to be. So is direct communication always good because... So, so there's a twist here. I'm asking that you have direct contact, which means watching real people do real things. I'm not saying to circumvent the command and control of your company by having customers say, hey, develop this for me and don't tell your boss. That's totally uncool. Right? The, the thing that you're portraying is not the kind of research that I'm asking you to do. Uh, that that, that um, contact that you have, the influence that someone is exerting, it's, it's just ruinous to the team behaviors. Now, if you were open about it and say, hey, I have to have my scrum master in on this and please you know, CC them or just respond back with that, I think you, you won't get fired. Yep. But, but that's okay, like um, my adopt the customer program. Um, we, are, we, the five of us, were the only people who had contact with this individual customer. But every cluster of five people in the team had their own customer. But we had a team process where we brought the insights back. We weren't individually making decisions that would change the direction of the project based on that one person or the one communication we had. So it, it has to go hand in hand. Yes. You get into scope creep. Scope creep. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Other questions? Yes. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. So the question, if, if uh, I can paraphrase it, is how do you measure the insights that you're getting from this widget that the customer ends up using? And um, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna separate things. There's measurement for those kind of things over representative groups of people and, and getting the right number of people to be able to extrapolate to the whole population. That's not what I'm asking you guys to do. I don't think that if, if measurement of behavior, perception, and preferences is not your day job, I don't want you guys doing that. I want you going and gathering insights. I want you to watch a person who's in one of these sessions and have an aha moment see something that lets you have an idea about what you should be doing and where it should be going. You can take that idea and then have it validated by the people who are counting numbers. So for instance, uh, and, and this, is, this is one of the things that my wife and I uh, always, always uh, kind of battle back and forth on. I love to get insights from people and then go seek the data. So I see that one person has had this really odd sequence of behaviors and, went and fell in a trap. I want to look at the analytics and say, has anybody else gone down this same path? And I find, look, 839 customers did it today. They're just not complaining. I had an insight. I validated with data. Now we have a problem. She would rather 
look at the data, say, hey, there's a pattern of behavior that people are having a problem with, go get an observation and see if they're really experiencing difficulty with it. So it's, they work hand in hand. Uh, and sometimes it suits your personality. I'm looking at you guys and I'm saying, you have your day jobs. I don't want you to become user researchers. I want you in your day job to become observers. So you, don't worry, you don't have to count. All right, there were a bunch of other hands. I'll get to you. Did you have your hand up? No, it changed your mind? Yeah. Okay, and when you say PM, project, program, or product? Project manager, okay. And product, and program? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I got your role, I got it, I got it. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we, we mainly never try to have the dad over the media talk to the client. Okay. Sometimes it's a nightmare when I'm communicating. <laughs> no, that's fair. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill down just a little bit and tell me if I'm insulting because I don't mean to be. Do you have direct contact with customers and users or is it just contact with the client? Uh, just with the client. Okay. So right now, There's something wrong with that. The client may be telling you what they want, but unless you can get behind their goals and understand what really needs to be delivered to the people they're delivering to, you're probably not doing as good a job as you can. Well, that was going to lead me to my next question. Okay. Every single time, like the current project I'm working on, communicating with the client, and you know, more than half times, you don't know what they want. You know? Sure. Yeah, sure. You end up being a goal coach, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so let, let me finish this thread and get back to your earlier one. So in that case, if you can convince that client to let you work with the customers, you can help them refine their goals so that they're asking you things that you can deliver that will actually get them to their goals. If in that situation it would benefit you, we have done this. We, I, we had a team in the UK who had its development in India. And we remoted those people into and showed them recordings when the times didn't match up of the things that we were doing with the clients so that they, who had a deeper understanding of the code base, could actually say, now I get what you're looking for. Here's a better way for us to deliver it. Um, but but you know, the, the other part of what you're saying is I get how difficult it is, especially if the client is convinced that they really do know what the customer wants. And sometimes you have to go gorilla and you have to say, I have some other insights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, hang on. I'm going to get him first. He's been trying for a while. Okay. Yes. So yeah, his question is, let's say you're a freelancer, uh, you've got some insights about customers, you want to bring them forward, but you need some validation. You don't have an in-house team uh, to do it. Um, there's a continuum, <laughs> all right? Um, I, I often caution people who are not empiricists, who are not trained people who understand the scientific method. I, I implore you, don't try and run a usability study. Um, you may be able to facilitate it, you may be able to run it perfectly fine, but if you didn't set up the structure appropriately, you're introducing hundreds of potential biases which give you a perfectly normal looking result that's meaningless. You really need someone who has the background and training to provide you the tight structure within which to perform. Even facilitation is a skill that if you're not comfortable practicing, you are guiding the results by what you're doing right now. 
which is nodding every time I say something that you agree with. Okay? It's something that has to be trained out of you. It's not natural. So, so that's one end of the continuum. I would say get over that hurdle. There are plenty of online, discount, uh, automated, remote usability uh, tools, companies that provide it as a service. Some of them will uh, custom recruit for you. Some of them have uh, a professional pool of people that all they do is take usability studies. The caution there is many of those people may not be truly representative. So take it with a grain of salt. They're getting people to look at your thing. They will find things. It may not give you the importance measures that you want. Um, there's other techniques. If you can get user experience uh, professionals from a variety of disciplines, you get an information architect, a visual designer, uh, an interaction designer, uh, maybe four or five of them, and you say, just do a cognitive walkthrough and do a heuristic evaluation of this product and tell me what's wrong with it. Uh, studies have shown that if you get five people who know what they're doing to do it, even without a deep understanding of your customer base, they will discover 80% of all the problems that your population will ever have. The problem is there too, they're experts. They find things that your customers won't ever be bothered by. They can't put importance measures on it in the same way without projecting. So we're moving up the continuum. Uh, the question is, how confident do you need to be? And how much are you tolerant of being wrong in what you discover? Uh, sorry, that's a long-winded answer. I've got room for two more questions. Not yours. I was going to ask something sort of in response to that. Okay. Would it depend on the, um, how high um, the level is for that insight? You know, if we're just talking about, do we think call it action at the bottom and the top, or, you know, versus um, how complicated data entry would be for somebody that's filling out a really complicated form or something? Yeah. I mean, Yes, yes. Um, so I'm just going to repeat it for, for the tape there. The, the point he was making is it really depends, again, on a continuum, the complexity, the difficulty, uh, how much you need to actually confirm. And the example was if you're uh, bringing out a form, it's a complicated form, you get four or five people to do it, you learn something. Um, there, there is a technique uh, at Microsoft, it, it, we did it in fledgling years. We used to call it lightning usability. I think it's been formalized now. It's called RITE, R-I-T-E. Uh, and the idea is it's an agile form of usability testing. And we were doing this 15 years ago and didn't think it was anything but efficient. Um, you get one person in a room studying the thing that you're looking at. And in the mirrored room behind it, you have the product manager, the dev, the user experience person, everybody who's there in the critical roles to make design decisions. And they're making redesigned decisions as they see that person in the other room make a mistake. The dev stays up all night long, delivers a whole new version the next day, you run participant number two. That person doesn't have the problem that number one had the day before. Hey, thumbs up. Uh, but they have another problem. Now you go in the whole cycle and you try and fix their problem. They repeat the problem from yesterday, your solution wasn't right. Dev stays up again all night long, fixing the problem, version three. And you take a different path until you get through five or six people and the problems go down. You've knocked out some of the big problems of your product without running 30 people. Is it valid for your population? Not yet, but you cleaned house. You've gotten rid of the UX basics. All right, I got a signal for one more question. Yours, yes, very patient. Um, I have a problem saying like no at work with like clients and customers. And I either can't say no or I have trouble like being respectful to like their idea that we're not just going to do. Yes. So do you have any like strategy or recommendation on how to kind of like defer work or be like calm <laughs> or like tell them no? Tell them like yes. no, we're not going to do this. Yes. No. Any, okay, yeah. <laughs> no, practice it with me. No. No. Yes. <laughs> no. No. His his question was he has he has trouble saying no. Clients ask for something and they want something a particular way, or customers are making requests. Um, so I am I am a psychologist. I'm a cognitive, perceptual, experimental psychologist. 
I can't get you over your problem of not saying no. But I am convinced you that saying no is probably one of the most powerful tools you will ever, ever have. Because your customers, your users, they are not designers. They are experts in what they do. They are experts in their jobs. You need to extract from them what their problems are. You don't need design solutions from them. That's your job. So you need to put some boundaries in there and, and say, I know what you're, what you're asking for. Can you explain to me why? Can you set me up with the situation? So you don't actually ever have to come out and say no. What you come out with is, I've got a better way to get you to your goal. All right. But really, saying no, super powerful. I had a, I had a VP, uh, actually, at Microsoft. Brian, if you see this, I'm talking about you. <laughs> um, and I had, I had just come in. I'd just taken over this big team. And, and now I report to this guy. And he kept meeting with all of these other teams and coming back to me and said, hey, I just made a commitment to this other team. Your team needs to deliver this. And I'm like, yeah, OK. And I go back to the team, and I'm like, how are we going to fit this in? Right? And we do this and do this. And we reached this point where I was having my weekly meeting with them. And I'm like, Brian, you have to learn to say no to these people. You can't keep committing my team. We have maxed out. And he goes, oh, OK, but you got to realize my job is to say yes. Your job is to say no. And I said, it really took me two months to learn that. <laughs> so, so yeah, say no. Say no. All right, thank you guys. I'm willing to hang out and answer more questions. So. All right.